Hello, health seekers. Welcome to another episode of the Keto Pro Podcast with myself, Richard Smith. Today, I am joined with the amazing Dr. Jen Unwin. Jen Unwin is a consultant, a clinical health uh, psychologist. She works with the NHS, helping patients manage chronic illness and achieve well-being. She also works as a GP uh, with her, her, her GP husband, Dr. David Unwin, uh, helping patients uh, stick to a healthy lifestyle. Uh, and both are leading figures within the PHC. Jen, welcome on board. Thanks for coming on today. So, so grateful to be here and thanks for having me. No problem at all. I'm super excited. It. Uh, I know we touched base a little while ago. Um, we met recently for the first time in the PHC event, in, in the PHC conference, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, highly recommend that for next year. Um, mm. And I, I think the recordings are also available, Jen. Is that right? Yeah, so I think I think you can still you can still sort of watch the live stream as it was recorded. I think there might be a small fee for now, but eventually they will go on the PHC YouTube channel, and all previous conferences are up there as well. So watch away, and if you feel the information has been of some use to you, make a little donation to the PHC. Fantastic, which I did indeed do um, straight after the PHC. So I made a, a small little uh, contribution. Um, I think it's. It, it, it's a cause worth donating to. Uh, I think a lot of people are unaware of the PHC and the work that, that you know we all do there. Um, and it's incredibly close to my heart as we were just discussing sort of mm. off air. I mean, one of the, the main talking points that I wanted to discuss today was food addiction. Um, now this, I believe, isn't recognized as, uh, as an illness within the NHS. Now, alcohol addiction, drug addiction, uh, but food addiction, gambling, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nicotine, caffeine, and yet, yeah. and food yet. addiction is is probably the, the the most dangerous. I mean, that is probably the yeah. biggest contributing factor to all health, ill health, and 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 you know, uh, it, it, it's like the um, I think of it like like the Empress New Clothes. Everybody knows that story, don't they? That that you know, there's just one little boy going, what about <laughs> you know. And that that's like that's the ours as the PHC kind of going, it's the elephant in the room, literally. Like, you know, what what are people thinking? Yes. I mean, there's there's um there was a paper recently which was absolutely brilliant, which showed that if you've got food addiction, um, you're six times more likely to have type two diabetes. So obviously there's some genetic factors, aren't there? We know there's a million environmental factors, you know, particularly currently. But it's those of us that are more set susceptible to not being able to control our intake of those particular foods, the ultra processed foods, which tend to be high in sugar and refined carbohydrates. Clearly, that's going to have an impact on, on our body. So, yeah, you're right. It's not yet recognized in the NHS. And I should just say I'm not I'm now retired from the NHS. So um, I did work for over 30 years in the NHS. But now I devote myself entirely to this, the PHC and Brilliant. Uh, working and researching in, in food addiction um not yet recognized either by the two bodies that could recognize it would be the world health organization which have a thing called the the icd which is the international classification of diseases so that not recognized there yet and in america they have a thing called the dsm which is the diagnostic and statistical manual which is hosted by the american psychiatric association they they could could recognize it um so the, the there are there are cases being prepared in fact we do, we have already made a bid to the who um to have it recognized but they they rejected it which we thought they would there's lots of reasons why they would um but it wasn't a very robust rejection so we're obviously gathering more data um we're getting all the experts in the area to, together to get some consensus statements around this disease so we've got a better case to go back with and there's another group um that are making the case in, in america as well so we're sort of you know <laughs> both both sides of attack yeah. but um, i just think well it um it walks like a duck it quacks like a duck it looks exactly like any other addiction um i think we just go ahead and we talk about it in the phc we're providing we're going to be providing training for professionals to recognize it. We're going to be providing courses to the public if they think that's a problem they suffer with so that they can get some help. We're just going to go ahead and not care that 
nobody else thinks it's a thing we think it's a thing yeah it's been my life experience it's been your life experience so many people say to us you know that once they heard that term sugar addiction or, or food addiction suddenly they kind of went oh god that makes sense of all my life <laughs> you know of why i've had these symptoms and um you know why i've be been unable to make these changes to my diet that i want to make long term so yeah I, i'm gambling on ask ask me another question <laughs> yeah it you know it's we were just chatting briefly uh before we came came on and i I was explaining this is something that's close to my heart because um, I I am a food addict. Uh, I love I love my food. Uh, I'm still addicted to food. Um, I'm just addicted to different food. The food that I used to be addicted to, the food that I was told was good for me, the food that I was told was healthy for me, was in fact detrimental to my health. And I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into that as we move on. But yeah. um, I remember, uh, you know, in my mid to late twenties, I was clinically obese. I've lost 107 pound uh, in total. Uh, I've reversed my diabetes. Um, I used to suffer with these daily debilitating migraines that would make me blind. I'd be bedridden for three days. I was on three different medications for my, for my migraines. Um, I still suffer with migraines, but instead of suffering daily, I will, uh, I'll get an attack maybe one to two times a year. And this now is driven through stress and lack of sleep, um, which yeah. when you work for yourself, <laughs> they go yeah. hand in hand. Our stories and... are very al aligned. You know, I had a, a lifetime of up and down, yo-yo dieting. You know, I put on weight really easily and then would so, sort of through gritted teeth, you know, lose some weight and then it would come back on and same, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a migrainer. And now same as you, I, I, I can't remember the last time I probably shouldn't say this. I can't remember the last time I had a bed, had to have a bed day because of, I do still get the occasional headache and it's normally sleep. Or if I uh, sometimes kind of slip up and have a bit of too much dairy, <laughs> uh, that, yeah. that could do it for me as well. So yeah, we've, and you know, I think we speak for millions of people around the world and in the UK, they think that the, um, if you look at studies, the the prevalence rate conservatively is about 10% of the population adults. And that's over 5 million people in adults in the UK. So, you know, you feel you're unique at the time because you're kind of struggling with your own issues and you don't know how to sort of resolve it. But, you know, for everybody listening who's identifying with what we're saying, you, you absolutely not alone and it's absolutely not your fault <laughs> yeah it it's it's surprised me over the years how all of these things seem to be connected or in fact they they are definitely connected all of these illnesses that we separate into different segments they all stem from insulin resistance and inflammation yeah. um yeah. It, it comes from the food that we eat and these are foods that we are told that are good for us. These are foods that we are told uh, are healthy for us. Um, and they are foods that are, in fact, detrimental to our health. In fact, I'd go yeah. so far as to say that most of the food in the supermarket is not even food. It's, it's not, not real food. food. It, Absolutely. Um, the the ultra processed foods, you know, they're, they're, they're trying, to, you know, it's a business. They're trying to sell more and more of them. I believe they absolutely know that 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 the things they put in them are addictive. I, I think they absolutely know that. And in fact, I don't know if you, if you know, but um, people who've sort of looked into it, when when it the, the writing was finally on the wall for the cigarette companies and nicotine, and they could see that, you know, that the end was nigh for their, in terms of growing their business, those those enormous tobacco companies bought the big food companies that, that were around at the time in the States. So there is that same model, there's that same addiction model of how they market stuff and how they they market stuff to kids, you know, kind of get them young, you know, the cereals yeah. and, and these the drinks, the fizzy drinks. And um yeah, once you once you see it, you just can't unsee it, can you? So this um it's like the, you know, say save yourself from all of it and and try and source some real natural whole 
whole, whole foods as nature intended and really defend our ability to do that, it's really a political issue that we have to fight for, for that right to, to eat real foods and to have it available um, yeah. as widely as possible. And, and that's where, yeah, uh, you, I, I, mean, I think once you've learned about it, you can kind of get r- quite riled up about, you know, if we, if you and I hadn't learned this information, you know, we, we might be literally, we might be dead. Yeah. You, know, you, you were so unwell in your twenties. You, you might no longer e- even be alive. And looking back to my parents' generation they both died of cancer quite quite young and they were living they were doing the low fat healthy <laughs> grains thing they thought they were doing the right thing and and living healthily and and um you know i don't i you know you don't know that that that's why they got ill but you know it it, it does make you think yeah but but we also know that cancer cells are metabolically inflexible isn't it the um, they're fueled by glucose. They cannot be they fueled by, by ketones. So, um, yeah. you know, we, we look at carbohydrate and sugar as being two different things because that's how they are presented to us on the label. But all carbohydrates break down yes. to sugar. All carbohydrates. Um, A lot and of that's our where... patients will say, well, I, you know, I don't, I don't eat sugar. I know I'm diabetic. So, you know what? I don't have sugar in my tea. Cut that out. You know, I, I don't have biscuits or whatever. But yeah, but they're literally having porridge and then you know pasta and then <laughs> yeah you know they, they don't realize that yeah. it's all glucose yeah a bowl a bowl of muesli you know i used to eat muesli thinking that i was being healthy mm. um and i think muesli is around 80 grams per 100 carbohydrate so so that's around 20 teaspoons of sugar give or take and then i would and we never eat we never eat the portion do we like i was like oh no you know, it says 30 grams, but you put 30 grams of cereal in a bowl and you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can live on that for a morning. Yeah. So you're filling it up and uh, yeah, a- absolutely. Yeah. And then we chop up a strawberry or a banana or something to go on. So we <laughs> add in su- we, we, we add sugar to, to our That's sugar. That's another five teaspoons there, right yeah. there in your banana. Yeah. And I don't know if the listeners know, you'll know, but in... In an adult's bloodstream at any one time, you need less than one teaspoon of sugar for, yeah. for your body to function efficiently. We don't, we've been sold this kind of sugar for energy, energy drinks, you need, you know, carving up for exercise. Um, I mean, if you were to carve up for exercise, you'd need a sixth of a banana then, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody, nobody's going to do that. Yeah. So I, I love that fact and uh, spread it around as much as possible and of course your own body will make, make. that sugar because otherwise if there were times of famine all our ancestors would have died out so uh, the, the liver can make that keep that level of uh, sugar that you need and also if you do exercise it's amazing how fast it'll gear up I don't know if you've ever worn a continuous glucose monitor and i was when- just about to come on to that because yeah. i put one on over the last uh, 10 days um i took it off a little early because it stopped working um but i did um a 10k run at kempton last sunday um no i'm i'm carnivore um so i eat zero carbohydrate uh, it's not mm-hmm. to say that i never eat any form of carbohydrate but m- months and months and months in between now i um i began the run at around about 4.3 um, uh, on the on the glucose monitor. And at the end of the run, it was 10.7. Now, wow. yeah. so that basically when you, and this was a 40-minute run at 91% of VO2 max, which we are told from the athletic community, for example, is impossible. Um, but I ran at 91% of VO2 max on zero carbohydrate. And what that tells me is that my body has the ability to, to create glucose um, through a number of mechanisms, so through gluconeogenesis, and being fully keto-adapted, my body will utilize the, the lactate in the muscle, it sends it to the liver, it recycles it as glycogen, ships it back to the muscle at a higher level than a carbohydrate athlete. So I had in my blood higher levels of, of glucose than a, a car- carbohydrate ath- athlete would have had while consuming copious yeah. amounts of, of, of energy <laughs> gels. So yeah. we do not need carbohydrate. The body will make any glucose that it, that, that we need. Yeah. Um, and that's another key fact that I think people just 
they just don't know that fact and some of these facts will really change people's lives you 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 know if you always struggle to moderate your intake of carbohydrates which i did <laughs> just abstain it's yeah. much easier and we all know that from the addiction model so we'd never say to an alcoholic right it's it's friday night you know so you're supposed to have a little drink so just have a little a little whiskey small whiskey or half a glass of wine we completely know that that's laughable and that they should abstain because they can't they've lost control of their relationship with that substance so it's exactly the same we've lost control of our relationship with carbohydrate and so that temporarily it's it's tough obviously but the 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 way out is abstinence and that's what we, you know, we teach in the courses that, that we do. And the, bearing in mind, if people are listening and they're on medications, <laughs> you don't want to go cold turkey without getting some support or discussing that with someone, particularly if you're on insulin, blood pressure medications or things like SGL2 inhibitors, which are going to lower, lower your blood sugar. Um, those will need titrating down. But for those of us not on medication, you're going to feel rough let's not deny it i felt terrible when i first went cold turkey for quite a few days <laughs> but then i felt amazing so it, you know it's um the abstinence is, is the key so you can you can either jump into it both feet if that's your personality and it is mine i don't know no you you kind of tailored it down you did you and david's the same my husband's the same he kind of went stepwise and for some people that's that's better um but it's exactly the same model. If we're accepting that it's an addiction, which I genuinely do because I've never been able to moderate, I've never been able to moderate my carbohydrate and never will. Um, so if we're accepting this addiction, then the obvious treatment model is abstinence from your drug foods. Yeah. Um, so that depends. Like, you know, we were talking about for you as bread and we have a lot of patients who really really are addicted to, to bread and really struggle to give it up but that's the answer for them it wasn't so i mean i would have problems with bread it wasn't so much that with me it was much more the kind of you know the sweet things really so yeah uh, but again but again it, it's all sugar happy. isn't it it's, it's all it's sugar, all sugar. Whether, it, whether, yeah. it chocolate, whether it was chocolate whether it was something sweet or whether it was carbohydrate your body still knows that it's glucose it um, doesn't look any different inside and to the the brain which we mentioned before it's it's uh um you know that's that's where the explanation is for why we keep craving um you know that that's going on in the brain that craving it's not a a hunger you know a proper i mean it does make you more hungry doesn't it but that's to yeah. do with other mechanisms around the hunger hormones yeah so for example i would drive to work <laughs> i'd take i'd take a banana sandwich i kid you not it was brown bread but it was a, <laughs> a ban banana sandwich <laughs> Have that in the car on the way to work i mean i was starving hungry by 10 o'clock two yeah. hours later you know is it lunchtime and then i'd have my little sad i'd have um brown pita bread with with hummus and a bit of salad thought that was excellent choice so i'd i'd have to i'd eat that before lunch and then be starving again so the carb the eating the carbs does just drive hunger to some extent but then some of us have this additional pieces we're so susceptible yeah. in our in our brains to what what goes on with when and again it's to do with insulin well it's part so it's there's several mechanisms shall i shall i expound go for it because I, I was just going to to add on to that that um when we look at the bread for example as you say that there are a number of mechanisms going on there and the reasons that there are a few contributive factors as to why we would crave food after eating bread for example um, one is the lectins. So lectins will, will block the absorption of other nutrients. They bind um, to, the, to the cells on the microvilli line in the gut and they, they take up the surface area on the microvilli. So any nutrients that you are consuming, co-consuming with that bread is being blocked. So now your body doesn't receive uh, the, the necessary signaling to say that you've eaten something that's nutritious. Um, and we know this where, when we look at studies, uh, when we look at zinc, iron and magnesium absorption, now, if we can co-consume, say, oysters, for example, which are high in, in zinc with uh, corn tortillas, those corn, the corn tortillas, the lectins and the phytic acid in the corn tortillas block the absorption of that zinc by 100 percent. 
So we're consuming this food. We think we're having something nutritious, but the lectins are blocking the absorption. Yeah. And lectins, yeah. of course it is, yeah. And lectins mm -hmm. also block leptin, which is the satiety hormone. So lectins block leptin. They block our body's ability to tell us that we've eaten, which leads us to over-consuming. So it's this this multitude yeah. of contributing factors which leads to this, this over-consumption of food. And we are consuming lots and lots of food, but our bodies are not receiving the oh, nutrients right. that it needs. So it, yeah. Um, so yeah, by all means, please, please expand. Yeah. And of course, it just made me think. Um, that's why restaurants give you bread, a bread basket. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> when you arrive, you think, well, I'm going to eat less if I eat this bread. No. And that, you know, maybe half an hour later, you when your main course arrives, you're you're ravening, and then you're going to have the dessert. So, yeah. um, yeah, that's that. That's why. Yeah. So, um, in the brain, several things can go on. So. One is because the foods we eat, these sort of unnaturally sweet foods that we really hardly, hardly ever would have encountered in the, in the wild <laughs> back in the day. I mean, honey would have been really the only super, super sweet thing. And um, then seasonal. Seen, and seasonal. And we've, yeah. we've all seen photographs of those kind of the original banana, haven't we? Which is like, it's this big with this horrid green with all seeds in it. You're not, you're not going to eat many of those in a day um so yeah so the kinds of foods have changed the only thing would have been honey and we would have been driven highly motivated in the autumn to seek out the fruits and the honey and and the nuts actually things like that that nuts even have this tight they they're the one of the rare things that has fat and a bit of carbohydrate in that we all find irresistible um so we the c cleverly what happens in the brain when we have sweet things is that it sort of um we get this big boost of dopamine which is the motivation and the drive neurotransmitter so dopamine is, is that transmitter it's reward it's motivation it's drive to do things and at the same time in the frontal lobes which are our sort of intelligent reflective bit where we're going to think or should I do this or should I do that? Um, high levels of sugar boost the dopamine and they repress the frontal lobe. So you're going to think, I really need to go and find that stuff. I need to remember where it is. I'm going to go today and I'm not going to be scared or thinking about the pros and cons of going um, because my frontal lobe is kind of dampened down, um, even if there's any danger associated with going to get the honey, which there is clearly because you've got to shin up a tree and put your hand in a beehive. Um, you're going to feel invincible. And I don't know if people recognise that, you know, when they get these cravings, they're, you know, people are driving to the garage in the middle of the night. They're really driven to go and get that stuff if it's not in the house, which it may be. So maybe in the house and then you're looking in the cupboards and doing that sort of foraging thing. Or you're you're literally driving to, to the 24-7 the convenience store in the middle of the night to get your particular drug food. And it's so illogical isn't it it's what, you know that we're driven to do things that are harming us we know they're harming us but in the moment we kind of can't resist so there's the dopamine piece when we get these unnatural foods these days you know like let me think of a <laughs> massively sugary example crispy cream donut there are other donuts available anything like that's very full of sugar and carbohydrate we get an unnatural level of dopamine in the brain that even back in the day when we were foraging for blackberries and things like that, we we would have very rarely found. Um, that kind of feels, it feels good, but the brain doesn't really like it, doesn't like these really high levels. Everything in nature's trying to balance out, isn't it? There's a lot of yin and yang with various nutrients in the body and hormones and enzymes and neurotransmitters. So the brain goes, oh, rather a lot of dopamine swishing around here so what it does it knocks out a few brain receptors for dopamine yeah and i hope you can see that's a really bad idea so over time the more sugary foods we eat the fewer dopamine receptors we have and the more depressed we become and you'd mentioned yourself you know how bad how bad you felt um and we know from research that high sugar diets are linked with depression uh, and anxiety and, and low mood and, and this and, and a lack of motivation which it depression literally is that isn't it it's a lack of 
feeling you want to sort of do anything and so 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 high dopamine becomes low dopamine and then we're chasing not the high but we're chasing trying to feel a little bit normal so then when we eat a mars bar we go from feeling absolutely flat and low and maybe shaky and weird to sort of feeling all right for an hour or two and that that's the hook then that's the the sort of drive but there's not just dopamine so we mentioned about insulin which is the the <clears throat> insulin's job is to lower the sugar in your bloodstream because sugar in your bloodstream is dangerous so it's got a great job to do and it pushes it into your into your fat cells um so when we eat something sugary we get this raise in insulin which does various things one of the things it does is let tryptophan um which is an amino acid more preferentially across the blood brain barrier and tryptophan's the precursor of serotonin so the other thing we get with a high sugar uh meal or or snack is more serotonin in the brain and we, oh we all love serotonin it's the sort of relaxed happy feel good uh neurotransmitter it's the one that antidepressants manipulate so um antidepressants job is to raise the level of serotonin in the brain so again the brain goes oh loads of serotonin um we need to drop out some serotonin receptors and again terrible idea because over time um you're less sensitive to natural sources of serotonin in your life um and you're going to get anxious and agitated and, and unhappy and so on so um yeah once I learned about the effects of sugar in the brain, that was one of the things that really did it. If I'd known that younger, I think I would have acted a, a, a lot faster. You, when you're young, you know, we can cope with these sort of levels of sugar to some extent, and we perhaps don't see the slow, um, <laughs> the, the slow decline mentally, because it's not, it's a bit like smoking, isn't it? You can smoke for a long time before you get the, the ill effect. So, um, yeah, those two mechanisms to me are in incredibly important and describe why we keep doing, you know, we keep repeating that behavior um, yeah. because we're just trying to feel OK. And we, yeah. we need to learn how to get those in my little book, Fork in the Road, which is um, Profits to the Public Health Collaboration. It's a little book about food addiction. Um, I talk about getting your daily dose because um obviously we've talked about abstinence so people have to abstain from their drug foods but for a while they're going to feel really bad because they've got these low levels of serotonin and dopamine so what you need to work on every day is boosting those things in in a in a in a more um natural way in a more in the way that nature intended and so i call it getting your daily dose of dopamine doses dopamine oxytocin which is the kind of closeness hormone <clears throat> serotonin and endorphins and there's various ways that you can do that um things like getting a walk outside in the sunshine will hit all of those you get your dopamine from exercise serotonin from the sunlight and from exercise and endorphins any kind of exercise like your 10k is going to give you a real boost of in endorphins and if you're running with other people or if you're walking with your dog you know, and you're interacting with people, you also get the, the oxytocin. So we all, food addiction recovery isn't just abstinence, although that's fundamental. It's also recovery in a true sense where you're recovering your your brain and your life so that you don't need to eat those foods to feel okay. A lot of us in modern life have got in the habit of medicating ourselves like you have a long day at work you get home in the evening you're exhausted and, and stressed and you sit in the front of the tv with with your doritos or your whatever it is it, it's it's that's really food as medication and not a very effective medication <laughs> we need yeah. to find other ways to handle stress um you know to deal with relationships and to sort of because a lot of us have been using food for all of that since we were very young. Some people since really, you know, they can't remember the time when they didn't do that. It, it Recovery does take 
a lot of effort and 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 kind of uh yeah kind of lifetime really so sugar's the only drug we give kids isn't it we don't give them cigarettes nicotine <laughs> alcohol we'd all frown on that and yet we've got it all wrong with the kids and we're we're um they've got easy accessibility and it's kind of cute give them an ice cream oh don't deprive them <laughs> and that's the thing you think that you were being kind but i've i've just googled here now um and what it says here is when an individual eats sugar, the brain produces high surges of dopamine. Uh, this is similar to the way uh, the brain reacts to the ingestion of substances like heroin and cocaine. Yes, cocaine. And that should <laughs> that should tell you <laughs> should everything that you that you need to know. Um, They've done and... a lot of animal studies on that, and they think, uh, particularly in the in the in the rat studies, uh, the rats preferred sugar That's water. It, yeah cocaine yeah. when they were addicted to both they would actually choose the sugar i mean it's it's mind is mind-boggling for sure it um it's it's scary because everything that you just said um you know is has been echoed in in the research that i that i've carried out but there, there are studies out there that say that um you know the food that we consume doesn't negatively affect the, you know the neurotransmitter signaling um in regards to food addiction and many other things but we know that this is the case because studies have shown that neurotransmitter synthesis can be affected by food. One study in, I think it was the 1980s on celiacs showed that when they were given gluten, uh, the level of serotonin in the, the cerebral spinal fluid uh, fell. And when they removed the gluten, it increased again. Um, so we know that there's, a, there's a direct correlation. And when it comes down to this you know, neurotransmitter synthesis, um, the catecholamines, so catecholaminergic neurotransmitter synthesis, we use the catecholamines, dopamine, epinephrine, no epinephrine, and uh, the adolamine, serotonin, uh, and as you say, synthesized by tryptophan and tyrosine. Um, but the interesting thing with this is that there are uh, cofactors involved. So there's a complex process involved with creating these neurotransmitters, but we need specific cofactors. Mm. Uh, we need cofactors like iron, zinc, and vitamin B12. Um, now, the issue yeah. is that excess carbohydrates, uh, carbohydrate consumption leads to insulin resistance and inflammation, um, and this can affect... Uh, a body, it, it can leave us susceptible to contracting viruses and infections. Um, COVID, for example, uh, insulin resistance increased the ACE2 receptor, the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor. Yeah. So excess carbohydrates led to, to an increase in the ACE2 receptors, which made us more susceptible. So people who suffered with insulin resistance were more susceptible to contracting the virus. But the overconsumption of, of, of carbohydrates leads to glycation, advanced glycation end products. Now, our natural killer cells become glycated. When they're glycated, their ability to fight off this virus and infection is massively reduced. Now, the problem with this is when we contract these viruses then, um, our bodies lose their ability to fight off the virus. So first of all, we become more susceptible to the virus, uh, right. you know, a pathogen or whatever it may be, illness. And then our natural killer cells is unable to, to fight it off as, mm. uh, as well. But when this happens, the body sequesters iron uh, and it stores it in ferritin. So despite having, you know, potentially high levels of, of, of iron in, in ferritin molecules in the blood, uh, it can still lead to a deficiency of iron um, because pathogens love, they love iron, they thrive on iron. Um, when we have a deficiency of iron, now the bodies lose their ability to create these neurotransmitters. Um, so when we're sick, uh, the neurotransmitter signaling within the brain is affected, uh, the catecholaminergic neurotransmitter synthesis, uh, and now dopamine and serotonin are affected. Um, and yeah. it, as, as you say, we're hardwired to chase dopamine. It, it, it's the reward pathway, and it's essential for our survival. We wouldn't, uh, you know, without it, we wouldn't procreate. Um, no, it's essential for the, for the, the survival of the human race. And, and sweet foods, as you say, release dopamine into the mesolimbic pathway, and we chase this addiction, but as we lose the ability to, to create dopamine, um, we end up over consuming on these sugary treats because we're constantly looking for this, this, this dopamine it. hit. But it's yeah. um, now the food that we eat on a daily basis has a massive impact on these things. It's particularly in regards to things like iron, B12 and zinc, because um, as we said earlier, when we're consuming these foods that are high in lectins and phytic acid, uh, a lot of the iron and B12 and zinc uh, are being negated. So again, um, there's a study, actually, I think um, 
I've pulled it up on my other screen that I looked at yesterday, and it was to do with uh, vegans and vegetarians. And I, I'm not against vegans and vegetarians. I, I work with lots of them. Uh, but the study basically uh, concluded that um, there was a positive association between the prevalence of depressive episodes uh, uh, and a meatless diet compared to a meat eater's diet. And the reason for this, and this isn't a stab, I, as I say, I work with, with vegans and vegetarians, but I think there's a lot of uh, miscommunication or misunderstanding in regards to highly nutrient dense foods because yes. spinach, for example, is packed with iron, but the human body needs heme iron. <laughs> Uh, and we can't we, we, we yeah. can't access we can't access the iron from from spinach so um being a vegan yeah. or vegetarian we're not consuming the iron so we're, we're you know we're, we're affecting these uh catecholaminergic neurotransmitter synthesis um b12 cobalamin is only available in in meat and animal proteins we you know unless we supplement with cobalamin but we can't get it from plants and zinc again is, is negated by as much as a hundred percent uh when we co-consume with things like lectins and phytic acid so the foods that we eat have a massive impact on, uh, you know, on food addiction, on the way we feel. They really do. And yeah, we really, again, you know, not bashing anybody's choices and the, re the reason why they choose them. But I think it's really important to, to know these facts, you know, that the, the brain and the body are made from protein and fat. So you need those building blocks. And literally, how do you, you know, we say in our course, like, how do you, to make a Lego house, you need the right kind of bricks. You need the little window pieces and the little roof tiles. And it's the same if you're building a body and brain. You you literally need those those building blocks to make things like like you say dopamine, serotonin, all the different hormones and things that that we need in in the body. You know, a lot of the um, vitamins are fat soluble. So if you're really if you're really low fat, you're not again you're not absorbing them. Uh, and I don't know about you, but my my mental health has been unrecognisably better since I I've since I've done this. And you know, I, as you say, we're only stating that as as you know our experience and sort of making sense if you think about the biochemistry. Um, yeah, yeah, it is, and it it comes back to what we said earlier that all of these things are connected. So. Um, mm. You know, I, I began by restricting bread. You know, bread is a grain. Uh, it's incredibly high in, in lectins. Um, it's also high in carbohydrate. So by removing the grains, I removed, and phytic acid, I removed one of the, the, the biggest contributing factors to my ill health. Um, mm. Now, there are other foods that contain these things as well, but the grains, I think, uh, are, you know, up there with arguably number one or number two. Um, later down the line, you know, I learned about the effects of oxidized linoleic acid, you know, the omega-6 oxidized linoleic acid, which is, which is found in vegetable and seed oils. Um, now, this can lead to insulin resistance uh, around about 6% higher than, than carbohydrate. So as a percentage, you know, if, if we were to help a client, removing seed oils is probably going to carry more of a benefit uh, because everything in the supermarket contains these vegetables, contains these yeah. seed oils. These all the processed oils, foods have those all, in them. All the process, yeah. almost every and packet. Often, in the when you when you eat in a restaurant, or you know, you go to a hotel and you have the breakfast, they've fried the eggs in, in yeah. sunflower oil or whatever it is, and yeah, it's it's it. You have to really try hard to, to eliminate it completely. Mm. You do, but what what I have found is that when so I, I went away to Kempton this weekend racing, um, and what what I do if I eat out is. Uh, and people say that it's difficult, but for me, it's incredibly easy. I just find a meat dish. Uh, I'll eat steak. I'll eat steak with yeah. steak. You know, um, I, I love fish. I love chicken. You know, I do eat cheese. Cheese works well for me. I get I get on well with eggs. Um, so I'll quite often order eggs as a side and maybe, you know, pan fried king prawns. But I'll tell the restaurant or I'll ask first, what are they cooking? Uh, and it's always seed oils. Um, so I'll tell them that I'm allergic to seed oils. Yeah. So then yeah. it's rather rather than saying, oh, look, I'm really fussy. Um, so I'll ask them to cook, you know, either grill, you know, dry fry or cook in butter, tallow, lard or ghee. Yes. And they've never not accommodated. And quite often, so the restaurant that we went to the weekend, um, they gr grilled the steak um, and they came back and I'd ordered eggs. And they said, oh, look, you know, the eggs we fry in in, in the seed oil. So, you know, can, can I poach them for you instead? So they, they were accommodating, you know, so yeah. th there's always, there's always an yeah. option, but every time you set foot into that supermarket, almost every packet 
that right. is labeled healthy or, or food is not food. These are franken foods that are high in these, in these toxic chemicals. Um, linoleic acid is detrimental to your health and it's absolutely everywhere you go. And I think by removing grains and seed oils from your diet and not even targeting carbohydrates per se, just by doing those two things, yes, you're going to see a massive impact on health and well-being. And then what I teach after that then is, you know, the importance of, of, of sodium electrolytes. Because again, we're told that sodium is detrimental to our health. Sodium is essential for life. We need way, way more, probably around eight times the volume that we're told. Uh, there was an interesting study that covered 100,000 participants over 17 countries. And it looked at sodium excretion. And what it found is that when we go below 1,500 milligrams per day, and this was sodium that was excreted, so we can assume that what was consumed was considerably more because the body's going to use some. Um, all cause mortality increased massively. Uh, and with the, the, the sweet spot being, I think on this study, was somewhere between four to 6,000 milligrams. But for someone on a low-carb lifestyle, because insulin resistance retains the sodium within the body yeah, when we go exactly. low-carb. I so was going to say that. Yeah, coming yeah. back to the point you made earlier, when you do go low carb, you feel awfully unwell and it's to do with the, the kidneys releasing. So the kidneys will pull sodium from four points in the nephrons back into the blood when we are insulin resistant. We recover from insulin resistance almost within weeks. And we can see this overnight. If you were to restrict carbohydrate today, by tomorrow, you would start to see a drop uh, in your insulin levels. Uh, and we can reverse diabetes and insulin resistance in as little as, as two weeks. Um, yeah. But the issue with this is this loss of sodium leads to yes. you know, what's called now keto flu was once known as the Atkins flu. And yeah, yeah. You, 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 anyone who's done it, you pee loads, don't you? Because the, yeah. the <laughs> fluid's coming away with the salt and uh, you lose that bloating. And yeah, yeah, it, it's quite, quite a rapid sort of physiological ch change that goes on. Yeah, yeah. but it, yeah, so you need the, the main the main tip is more salt, more salt, you That's know, it, yeah. when you're first few days plenty of salt on on your plenty food of salt yeah i i put yeah i i, I salt don't like no one's business <laughs> yeah but i don't know if you know dave have you come across dave feldman who's the guy who's doing all the studies into people like me with super high cholesterol that's another that's probably another podcast so i've got i've got super super high cholesterol and um he they're doing a documentary so they, they came to visit and uh I, I, he's the only person I've ever met who puts more salt on his food than I do. And I was like, nice work. You know, yeah. He's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Salt with your salt. So salt my cholesterol, my, my cholesterol is quite high. Um, the last test I did, it was 10.26. Uh, my LDL was eight point something. Um, but that's fantastic. Uh, you know, when you understand <laughs> cholesterol, uh, we understand that it's triglycerides. Uh, you know, we want high HDL, and it's the triglyceride to HDL ratio, and it's more to do with pattern A and pattern B LDL. Which and it's when we because go... we're using um, fat, fat for fuel. Like you know, when you're running, you're saying you know it's it, it. We're just literally it's a transportation system. It's taking energy to the cells. Mine's nineteen. Not to be competitive, of course, in any way. <laughs> Damn. <I've... laughs> Right, I need to increase mine. <laughs> Incredible. And with a zero, um, so, uh, you know, obviously the thing that people, the reason they say cholesterol is bad for you is because they think it's going to cause heart disease. So I don't know about, I don't know about you, Rich, but I've had um, a heart, the heart scan, which looks for calcium in the heart. I've had it twice now and I've had a zero, zero. score. Zero, yeah. Snap, yeah. me too. So, yeah. Uh, so, so I, worry about there. I eat stupid amounts of, of dietary fat and I also have zero calcification which goes against all the literature. But these, these are the things that I point out in, in, in the lectures and talks that I do. Um, there's a, 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 a podcast that I did with Ben Azadi from America. Um, mm -hmm. And we went into cholesterol and lipid profile. Um, these, these seed oils are high in phytosterols, which artificially lower your cholesterol. Um, so when we remove them, people think that going low carbon keto, we see an elevation in cholesterol and they think that it's, it's, it's a dangerous marker. But this is your body just returning back to its natural physiological level when we yeah. remove these seed oils the phytosterols they, they compete they compete for absorption um and i think the the body tries to excrete the phytosterols to, to the to the max capacity because it doesn't want the phytosterols but generally we we hold around one percent um but there is um something called cytosterolemia where uh, a small percentage of people will hold up to four percent and that there's massive increases in in uh, cardiovascular disease uh, by, by a, a long way and, and that 
this comes from a food. It isn't a food, is it? No, it's called a food, but we know it isn't a food. It's machine lubricant. Uh, it comes from this, this item, this chemical that's in these foods that is uh, absolutely detrimental to health. And we are told it improves you know, cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular uh, health. Uh, and it does the opposite. It, it absolutely does the opposite. The brain, the body, and the heart need saturated fat. We need cholesterol. Every cell in the body is made of cholesterol. Yeah. Every cell in the body is made of amino acids. Hormones. The brain, the brain, hormones. the brain's, brain's exactly. very cholesterol heavy. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, it, every cell in the body is made of cholesterol. It's essential for cell formation, cell communication, nutrient absorption, nutrient transportation, hormone production, as you say, and it's essential for healing. And this is why after following an operation that I had two years ago, I healed in 24 days. Uh, the wound healed in 24 days, and I was told to expect 12 weeks. Uh, the wow. doctors and nurses were flabbergasted by uh, the speedy recovery, and I explained that it was to do with you know the high high volume of protein I consume and the high volume of of fat. Um, yeah, which is absolutely incredible, and it's proof positive that the lifestyle we live is in fact a healthy lifestyle. Uh, but it quite literally goes against the grain, doesn't it? And I think you know the, the you know the, the key to to, to food addiction and health in general, in, in my opinion, I think is, is obviously we know processed foods are bad for us. We know alcohol is bad, you know, so either remove those or heavily reduce, um, yeah. remove grains. Grains are, are not meant yeah. for human consumption. They're detrimental for our health. Uh, and grains today are not in the form that they were, you no, know. Uh, they, they've, bought, they've all been manif sort of, you know, yeah, hybridized, bread, yeah. Be super glutinous and, um, yeah. Yeah. And and even coming back to gluten-free products. So gl gluten-free products still contain wheat germ gluten in, uh, which has been known to travel up the vagus nerve and, and be a contributing factor, things like Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, wheat germ gluten in will still cause intestinal permeability. Uh, and wheat germ gluten in will cause intestinal permeability in everyone. Intestinal permeability leads to autoimmune disease. So if, if you consume grains, you have intestinal permeability and you have some form of autoimmune issue within your body. But these are foods that we are told, you know, uh, wheat the bex, you know, there's always adverts, isn't it, on, on, on the TV and on the radio. Not that I watch TV anymore. I've given up. I, I don't I don't watch telly. I don't, don't look at the news. I couldn't even tell you what's going on in the world these days. Um, I've come to the understanding that whatever's on the news these days, generally the opposite is true. Um, but uh, that's that's a podcast for another day, I think, isn't it? But it um, grains and seed oils, if, if there's two things you're going to change, take those out of your diet. But eat, yes. eat whole food, as you say, and, and predominate your plate. This is what you know, my opinion. You know, so I'd love your take on this as well. But as I say, I'm, I'm carnivore. I've removed um, you know, all, all fruit and veg because of the, the plant toxins, the phytoalexins. Um, uh, and I did saw through laziness. If nothing else, I mm. I couldn't be bothered to fry it does and cook. My life, that's for sure. I mean, uh, mostly when we're at home, I'm 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 more or less the same. So what I've had, like, so my son's a butcher. You're going to be jealous about this. He's butchering nice. things. <laughs> my quality, everything. If we want it, um. So I had some of his home cured bacon and three eggs for 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 breakfast. Um, we're going to have a barbecue tonight. I might or might not eat some lunch, but then uh, barbecue tonight with you know uh, grass-fed beef steaks and some little lamb chops on there um yeah i mean you could you could add a bit of coleslaw couldn't you but it's just so easy not 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 to mind if i go if i'm out and about um or people are feeding me i sometimes eat a little bit a little bit of veg just you know yeah. not too, too weird and it doesn't seem uh, that i don't find that that kind of does me any harm really i can't i can't eat masses of dairy i get a bit in a bit bloated and inflamed it makes me a little bit cravey yeah. um well, and that yeah. makes sense to me because you know dairy is a growth food you know it's really for baby animals isn't it so <laughs> to make them eat more you know particularly milk and um and cream and so on so uh, it makes sense to me that that would increase increase my appetite so i really i really try and minimize that and i try and I have to minimize or avoid nuts and seeds because, um, again, I get that kind of can't control the amount thing. And, those, and again, that's also what I'm looking for, you know, in terms of food addiction recovery is which foods can you kind of eat your meal, you satiate and you move on and which foods will I eat? And then later on or the next day, 
my hunger levels kind of you know exactly like i don't know if you found you or if you had any of your um snips done you know these kind of genetic factors no. you can look at um and that was super interesting because all the things that came out were so true and things i'd sort of found out myself which is one i mean i don't have caffeine now because um that was contributing to headaches and I, I, because i'm a bit of an addictive type i was having more and more caffeine and i was as, as you do <laughs> as you do so I'd, I'd cut that out anyway but i'm one of these that, so some people can metabolize caffeine really well can't they david's one <clears throat> other people not so much and i'm one of those so it would sort of hang around in in the system so that that was one of the these snips that i had um what else did i have oh and I, yeah i've got a low sensitivity to the sort of satiety hormones so um it said you know i'm probably a person who's going to tend to overeat so that would that would be true because i seem to have this sort of you know low sensitivity so all all the all the various bits and bats that that came out um oh and i can't i can't methyl meth methylate so they've they've recommended having some methylated folate is that right folate, yeah folate, yeah yeah. so because i can't make that myself for some reason so it was it was yeah super super interesting thing to do i'll 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 send you the link after if fantastic. you're interested yeah for sure well, for sure yeah. i appreciate that i get you know there's a few things there i mean a, a fantastic source of folate is, is is animal proteins um you know I, i'll touch base on that again now but it, um the milk or dairy products high in casein which contains casomorphine uh which is highly yes. addictive um, yes. And then the nuts and seeds, lectins again, so it blocks that satiety signal. And this is why when you open a pack of nuts initially, yeah, even on like a keto lifestyle, you, you have, so I, I used to have a handful, I'd go away and then I'd be back and I'd have another handful. And before I, I knew it, this, this massive bag of nuts was complete. And you don't realize, um, you know, the, 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 the damage that that's doing because you, it's only one handful at a time. But before you know it, this massive bag of 300 grams of nuts. The first <laughs> one is the, the one you can avoid, isn't it? And of course, it again, it makes evolutionary sense. It was great in the in the autumn if you could turn off satiety and we would all just whatever we could find. You know, we're going to pile it down. We're going to fatten us up for the winter. winter. Yeah. Our, our relatives were clearly good at that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. And then you know you're still alive in march when when the next food is is available yeah. you know some of them would would have not not eaten for for days on end in the winter and and i can i would be fine you know <laughs> i would have survived yeah. <laughs> because i had plenty of what my kids used to call winter skin <laughs> <laughs> i like it <laughs> yeah i yeah i i love my food i'm still uh, yeah I, i'm still addicted to food but I'm addicted to steak, yeah, eggs. Good food. Yeah. Same. And... I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always thinking about food still. I'm a, I do love to cook. Yeah. You know, but more meaty things now. Um, I love to feed other people still. So foods are really still a big part of my life. It's not that I think people often think, you know, you're going to live on this horrid, bland, miserable, you know, foodless desert, yeah. but you know, it's more of a celebration of, what what yeah the real a real human proper human diet as ken berry would say yeah and it's you know the question that i get asked quite often is well where where do your vitamins and minerals come from and people don't understand because we are it's embedded from such a young age that vegetables and fruits are the only place to get vitamins and minerals yeah meat or animal proteins are the most nutrient dense foods on the planet yeah. they contain and eggs, every I mean, eggs and eggs eggs yeah there's everything in there to make a chicken so you know it's going to have everything exactly that, yeah that you need. yeah 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 it, so it yeah i mean when we look at every vitamin so vitamin a um you know we are told i was told growing up to eat my carrots uh for vitamin a for retinol so i could see in the dark but mm. no plant contains retinol they contain beta carotene which is a precursor that needs to be acted upon by an enzyme called bcmo to convert it into the active form of retinol and to do so it's it costs the body it's depleted by 21 times b vitamins incredibly low from 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 plants vitamin b12 cobalamin doesn't exist in plants um vitamin d we get from the sun and we get from animal proteins kale i used to consume for vitamin k well k kale contains zero vitamin k um, you know, if you if you pick up a pack of kale in the supermarket, there's a stamp on there that says high in vitamin K, which is a fallacy because the human body needs K2 and kale contains K1. Um, yeah. You know, 
uh, and, and the list goes on and on. Uh, the, yeah. These other these other plant sources do not contain creatine, carnitine, carnosine, carnitine, taurine, all of these things which are choline, which are all essential. You know, essential to the brain and the yeah. Exactly. So it yeah. every vitamin and mineral is found in much higher quantities in in animal proteins. Animal proteins are either 100% or close to 100% bioavailable. And there's no uh, conflicting compounds within the animal proteins as there is with with uh, with plants. Um, you know, there's chelating agents within plants that prevent... So a plant could contain a high volume of a vitamin or mineral, uh, but there's agents in there which block, which block the absorption and the body's ability to absorb those nutrients. Um, Anti-nutrients, you know, they, they prevent the body from absorbing nutrients in other foods. Um, and that's what led me down to a more animal-based type lifestyle. And my my relationship with food has increased massively. Um, I, I when I had this continuous uh, blood glucose monitor on, I decided to experiment a little. So I consumed a few foods that I would not usually consume. Um, I had an incredibly bad stomach for a few days. <laughs> Um, you get so sensitive to it, don't you? If you ever go, I mean, I hardly ever do it now, but we've been doing it for 10 years. So occasionally you would, you would, for whatever reason, eat something sort of, you know, off, off what we're talking about. And it's incredibly how, how sensitive you, you, you've become to those, uh, yeah. you know, to having those foods, you, you soon feel unwell, which is great because you then get that signal. But when you're eating a lot of stuff like that you can't hear that signal because you, exactly. it's all noise it's all noise and you don't know what particularly to you you need to avoid or you know because you can't you can't hear what's going on yeah so a, a, a few clients have said to me previously that you know going keto has made me intolerant to certain foods and that's not the case it's a case of in the same respect like alcohol when you begin drinking uh, one glass of wine will you know will give you uh, you know, that tipsy feeling before you know it, you're onto a bottle or two bottles. So it doesn't mean that alcohol isn't causing damage. It just means your body is unable to recognize when it's causing the damage. And we get yeah. this heightened sense, uh, don't we, when, when we've, you know, we, we restrict these foods, we give our body that ability to, to recognize when we are putting these toxins back in, um, this experimenting made me, yeah, it, it made me unwell for a few days. Yeah. Um, but it, uh, it, it taught David's me a lot. Done that, David's done that a few times, you know, for Twitter, you kind of do, you know, this is me eating raisin bran and this is me eating and uh, <coughs> say like, you know, afterwards he's like, oh God, I'm so hungry. I can't believe how hungry I am. And he's kind of prowling around and normally can, I mean, he can go all day on one meal or whatever, you know, he's he's not a hungry person really. But when he's done these experiments, um, yeah, it really puts him out. And did he find the same as I did that um, experimenting with those foods brought back those cravings? So yes. all all yes. of this week, I have been craving sweet things. Um, I've abstained, yeah. um, but I could have so easily had slipped. Yeah. yeah, so it's incredible. So this, and this is the other thing that's really important. We t also teach in our courses that obviously people are going to slip up, particularly in the early days, but what they're, they're hopefully going to learn from those slip ups um that addiction's not gone away it's it's there in the background and there's reasons actually why if you if you have a slip you go straight back into it and sometimes you feel you're in a worse place than you were before it's really a powerful thing and it's to do with that dopamine story so so we were saying, weren't we, that the brain's knocked out the dopamine and um, so you're having to have more and more to get the same effect. When you cut it out, of course, over time, slowly, your brain has upped the number of dopamine receptors back to. And, and in fact, it's probably gone a bit higher because it's really trying to get get all the all the dopamine from the various sources. You know, it's not being bombarded by these sugary foods. So you've got lots of dopamine receptors. So when you then have your bowl of muesli or your your Mars bar, bang, you know, your, 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 your brain's lit up, lit up with dopamine. So that's, um, that's partly why if you have a slip, it's then really hard to get back to it because it was such a sort of such a high, you sort of want to repeat it again. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, it's, it shocked me. I'll be honest because I've been, I've been living this lifestyle for 10, 11 years. Um, yeah you know, low carb, ketogenic, and the last four to five years, I've been predominantly carnival. Um, 
I thought that I was through all of those cravings. And last weekend was a big shock. I yeah. began to shake because I was craving something sweet so much. Um, withdrawal again. Yeah, yeah, it's like another withdrawal. Yeah. So it, wow, it isn't, is. that, isn't that interesting? And it, some people go through that cycle, you know, quite a few times before they really understand that it has to be abstinence. Um, and of course, that's quite a scary thing for people who have relied on these, you know, they feel they're relying on these foods for for happiness and mental stability. You know, to ask someone to to give that up for life is suddenly sometimes so scary that they end up sort of David's had a couple of patients who he's sort of gently talked to them about this idea of food addiction and they they disappear. And what they're doing is, you know, just kind of eating more, more than ever because the, the idea of giving the those foods up is is so frightening so that bit like alcoholics anonymous it's important to think about as you've been doing this week i'm sure one day at a time you know just get through this get through this next hour it's going to get easier and you have to just sort of white knuckle through to you know to 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 keep that abstinence but it does get easier over time so then it doesn't become about white knuckling it's it's completely fine it's only when we keep eating the drug foods that we keep having to go through that um that yeah. that withdrawal mm. For sure jen it's been absolutely brilliant um i know that you have another appointment coming up um would you like to share some final thoughts and tell the listeners where they can find you and a little bit about your um uh your your your, your little getaways that you hold on the weekends as well i think you've got another one coming up shortly um yeah it's uh hit, fire away hit this yeah one, uh... i really enjoyed it yeah it could go on all day couldn't we I, I, um, yeah, for sure. yeah so so um so with a couple of colleagues we do we're doing various things as i said we're going to launch these online courses for healthcare professionals to learn about food addiction we're going to be running courses for the general public that will either be pre-recorded so you can just work through it in your own time or you can join us for a coach course um and uh, as rich says we we do weekends at the moment we're doing them twice a year so there's one coming up in november in the lake district so it's kind of friday to sunday and we go through all the all the information you need the food's all good obviously because we've uh spoken to the chef and we've got it all you know absent foods and you'll be with a group of maybe 12 to 14 people depending on depending on who signs up so and it's a, it's a lovely spot um all of that if you go to the public health collaboration so it's www.phcuk.org and you click on resources there's a section for food addiction resources um and you can sign up there to to be told like you know whatever you're interested in we'll kind of let you know or you can sign up there for the weekend and we'll we'll get in touch with you um if you're interested you just want to read a bit more yeah the little book that i've done which is on amazon fork in the road all profits to the phc and we've also got a journal there it's a hundred day journal so it's for people that are trying to start out on their journey with this and they want to you know keep some records and see which things affect them and also encouraging them to do these other things during the day that are going to boost their neurotransmitters. So it's a kind of sister publication to, to fork in the road. Um, yeah, I think that's probably, Oh, well, look, follow me on Twitter because David's got millions of followers and, uh, he's always boasting about it. So follow me on Twitter. <laughs> again, Let's get your followers unwin. up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Again, yeah. underscore unwin. Fantastic. And I'll pop all of those links below. Uh, Jen, absolutely fantastic. Thanks again for coming on board. Um, Thanks for having me. We'll get you back on again and we'll talk about another topic soon, hopefully. Yeah, definitely. Fantastic. Awesome, lovely. Thank you, Jen. Bye now.